As mentioned before, my name is Tim Christman. I lead the organization called Foundation for the Future. We do industrial policy for the space sector based out of DC. And as part of that, I'm excited to host a panel talking about Rust Belt to Space Belt. Ultimately, the US is where it is today because we were an industrial power. World War II really showed that, and it's the remnants of that industrial and post-industrial power that give us the edge we have around the world. And when we look across the country, we see a lot of opportunity to use that skill, that expertise, in industries that are adjacent to space, that are close enough. And so I wanted to bring in a pair of women who lead companies that are not, that their background's not space. So the three of us on stage are not trained space people. I do political science, Joy's strategic communications, Lee is an oil and gas executive. So when we look out and see the rest of the US, we see people that look more like us than maybe a lot of people in the space sector. And so I'm excited to talk with both of them today about what got them here and what's gonna get more people like them into this sector. So welcome, Joy Schaffler, Lee Steinke. Thank you so much, glad to be here. <laughs> So the, at the end of the day, the question is, who should be in space? There's a lot of questions about qualifications and the jobs people should have, but like at the end of the day, who, it, you know, who should be? Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about that. When uh, Dan Faber's talk really uh, got me thinking, I usually talk about risk and reward, but his focus on trial and error, those are kind of similar concepts, and when you're, you're in the phase of an industry where trial and error becomes iterative, the way he's describing, and you're trying to make, to, to turn what's exploratory into a business, um, that takes more than just the people doing the trial and error. It takes the people conceiving of the trial and error, executing the trial and error, measuring, and then the people who support that whole effort. You have to talk to the public about that trial and error, right? whether it's tweeting or, <laughs> or having a full staff of professionals who help guide how you communicate with the public about the value of what you're doing. Uh, I think that uh, certainly in oil and gas, when we started doing trial and error heavily in one phase of a disruption, um, roles changed. And so we had, instead of having an accounting department that was you know, in another building, an ivory tower of corporate, Right, they actually sent accounting people to work in the groups, in the asset teams with the engineers and the scientists because there were no codes in accounting for what needed to be done. There, were no, there was no precedent for measuring the things that we had to measure. And so there are all kinds of people who need to come in with, in all disciplines to run a full-scale trial and error effort that we're gonna be undertaking here in the space industry. Yeah, and I think, you know, your point about being able to communicate that throughout uh, isn't something that comes natural to engineers and scientists. And Joy, I think this is where what you do is so important with your strategic communications work. Well, thank you. You know, when, um, when I sold my last company, I really focused on what are the big new trends for um, going forward? What are the things that are most exciting in the world? And how can I participate and how can I educate myself to, um, to get involved and, and build a team and an agency that will service that and help get the message out. And one thing that I found about the new space sector was just the, um, not only the excitement, but the willingness to allow outsiders in and to not only allow them, but to hear the message of, you know what, we need we need gas stations in space. We need logistics in space. We need 
you know, welders in space. We need all of these people and we want you there. And it's just such an inclusive type of industry um, that, you know, it's exciting to be in. It's exciting to hear that because as an outsider who spent most of my career in the financial services sector and financial technology, um, but had a real passion for this industry, it was you know, just so welcoming that, um, you know, that everybody was welcome in. Uh, because not all industries are like that and there's not the outside perception of that. Yeah, no, I, that is something that I've noticed with the space world is any, any exclusion is accidental. They don't mean to. They're just using the fancy word that they learned in school and they didn't know that nobody else understood it. They just assumed everyone did. Um, but they want everybody else to get it. They're excited, they're passionate, and that's you know, the one thing that unites just about all of us is we really get excited about this. Um, but it can be intimidating. You know, when you look across at what people do when they grow up, you mm -hmm. do what your parents did. You know, that's how I joke that doctors are bred. They're not trained. And that's something similar with space. When you look at it and talk to people about space, it's, oh, it's an astronaut or a rocket scientist. That's intimidating. Um, you know, you might as well say you need a gold medal at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, how do you tell people, no, space is for you? Yeah. Yeah, I think you mentioned multi-generational, but you didn't go all the way there. I think there's value in that. You see a lot of multi-generational people uh, in this industry and in some other similar industries. But um, for me, I... I'd like to go back and tell you just a little bit about my family. So my, my grandfather on the one side uh, was the first in the family to get out of the coal mines and he became an engineer for U.S. Steel you know, in, the, in the Rust Belt. My other grandfather was an engineer for DuPont uh, in advancing chemical engineering and uh, products that we still use today. And then my father became a philosopher and so when I was looking for another, you know, I became a scientist and I've run large engineering programs. I understand trial and error from a technical standpoint, but there's still that philosopher in me. And so when the opportunity came to explore another industry, the combination that the space sector offered of thinking and doing within the same projects uh, was really appealing to me. And so, um, you know, I think each of us here has, has a driving thought process behind why we're here and the, the, the depth of the passion in this industry is fascinating to me. Um, and that's, that's sort of my reason. Yeah. Well, and, and Joy, you know, you're, you're good at this. You've scaled a communications company, sold it, and now have another. Um, you know, what, what's the message that really connects to the rest of the public about these hard or technical fields. How does that work? So I, th I think a big part of it is um, it starts at talent, it starts at education. And so, you know, in the search for talent, um, where are you going? Like, is there messages at the community college level? Um, you know, is there messages being told in different industry trade publications where there's a crossover or where we know we're going to need that talent in five, ten years? Um, where is the transferability of those skill sets and how can we go to those conferences or um, go to those educational environments and start to share that, you know what, you, this is possible for you. Like, you can have this. You can achieve this. You don't have to, um, you know, just be, you've got the, this particular skill set, that doesn't mean that this skill set, you're limited to this. There's all of these possibilities. Like, space is expansive. There are so many options here. Um, and so being able to communicate to the, the industries that touch on it, that are um, right next door to start to bring the people in, to start to educate what is possible for them so that they can get the skills, I think is huge. And then also being able to share with the investment community as well, hey, you know what, you might see these particular things um, 
in, you know, uh, minerals mining or, you know, like the, the standard things that you see an investment deck on um, that maybe don't make sense, but there is so many picks and shovels that are going to be needed in this, um, this next phase of space. Like, where are you putting your money in your, um, here that, that you can benefit that, that you can help expand it and that you can make a great return on your investment because you're helping to, um, to really grow that industry. So, you know, I love the work that you're doing because it's really about developing and building that infrastructure mm -hmm for space, it's, you know, it's the boring job, it's making space boring, I just love that. Um, that is what's gonna get us there, I think. Yeah, because, you know, at the end of the day, when we look at something that's precious, we're like scared to do things with it, we're scared it's gonna break, it's a Fabergé egg. But, you know, as Dan was mentioning earlier, if it's, you know, just, we know it's gonna break at some point, um, now we're just trying to figure out how do we do it, you know, nobody, terribly concerned about their Lego breaking, unless you're four. Um, but like, you just, you take it apart, you put it back together, you t uh, rinse and repeat. And I think that's something that is easier for non-engineers and non-scientists to grasp. Engineers and scientists, you know, they spend their entire lives sometimes working on a single problem and so they're functionally artists and they get really invested in that. And so that then can look scary to, you know, somebody like me with a political science degree. You know, I'm not great at math. You know, Cameo asked me if I ever graduated uh, from anywhere that taught math. The answer is no, I didn't. <laughs> um, but that's that's an intimidating prospect. And so, you know, how in that in that world where we're trying to bring in more people, trying to bring in different sorts of people. How do, we, how do we convey that we, we still want you? It doesn't matter if you know, you're like Tim and not very good at math. Yeah, I, I think um, it has to come to a certain extent from the person. Mm. Um, but I'll, I'll tell one story that I told in, in another panel once uh, I played pool. And when I first joined my Tuesday league after 20 years of not doing it. Um, I started talking with people. I just entered the space sector and knew that, that companies like Sierra Space were hiring 1,000 people right in our community. And uh, I started asking people what they do. Well, they're all technicians, right? They're building machines. They're building circuit boards. They're, they're working for Comcast. They're electricians. Uh, and none of them knew that the space sector was hiring because we post our career fairs on LinkedIn, and guess where they're not? They're not on LinkedIn, <laughs> right? They're, they're at the car show, they're at the pool hall. They're enjoying their lives, and then they're going to work with their serious technical skills that we desperately need, and we're not finding them. So I think there's a disconnect. You know, some of them wear NASA t-shirts even. Like, like they're into it, um, so I think some of it is on us for being in the wrong place at the mm -hmm. wrong time. Yeah. And some of it's on them for not going, hey, you know what, I like NASA and I have some skills for building stuff. Why don't I look around, right? So I, I don't know that that's the most relevant or helpful answer, but yeah. No, I yeah. think that's really important. There was uh, at Ascend, uh, there was a talk, Mor Baya from Privateer yeah. was talking and made the point that you're gonna to need to get comfortable talking with rap stars and influencers on TikTok, because that's who's reaching the people you wanna be talking to. They're already talking to them. So you better figure out either A, how to grow your audience to the same size, or B, leverage the people who already have it. Um, and that's not something you know we're used to. We're used to press releases and just assuming people will find us mm -hmm. on LinkedIn or something. And you know, you, you've worked with a lot of startups and smaller companies trying to get their message out. What, you know, how do you overcome that uh, you know, founder's dilemma of, I know everything about this, so doesn't everyone? How do you overcome that? 
Yeah, I think what, whether it's smaller companies or um, enterprise or like the Air Force is one of our clients, mm, for example, yeah, yeah. Air Force Cyberworks, um, Bell Flight is a client. Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, we have all sorts of different levels of clients and regardless, it's really looking and saying, okay, what are, um, what are the goals that we're trying to accomplish here? What are, you know, what are our strategic goals? What are the things that um, we need to do? Who are the people that we bring in? And then looking at like, how else could we get there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes that's speaking at a conference. Sometimes that's speaking in front of an audience that you would never even think to, to speak in front of, to your yep. point. Um, it's really looking and, and understanding like who are these people that we're trying to reach, whether they be partners or investors or congressional leaders or, you know, innovators out there. It's really all about finding out like what are the things that are important to them and how will it resonate and how can you connect and, and really kind of, you know, come from that powerful angle. And so I think as you know, especially in early stage company, what ends up happening sometimes is you you got yourself in like this little box and this eco um, chamber where you hear you know from only people who who like tell you yeah. what you want to hear right. or you know like you're yeah, you're yeah. just in this little ecosystem, and it's how you break out of that. You mm -hmm. know, how do you go to conferences where you might hear different perspectives yeah. or interact with those people. So it's you put yourself in the right rooms from mm. a digital and an in-person perspective and you really like explore and get deep about who who is going to help me accomplish these mm. things, yeah, this yeah. mission. Um, and it could be like all sorts of people you would never expect. Yeah. No, and I mean it's it, it's a it's a you know it could be scary putting yourself out there. Um, you know we we talk Lee about how you know that transition between non-space into space, and you really do. It's a similar thing. You have to put yourself out there and take that first step. Um, and for us individually, that's you know a lot of times that's on us. We sh we should be taking that first step. But when we're talking about connecting to a community, like the space belt connecting to the Rust Belt, I think that's on us. We need to go to them because, as you mentioned, they're not on LinkedIn. And so, you know, what, what would you want if you were in the Rust Belt? What would you want the space community to do? We've only got a couple minutes, so, you know, what would, it, what would you hope for if you're at a pool hall? Right, right. It's a tough one because every industry, and every industrial mechanical industry in the world right now is short on those kinds of skills. So it's, you know, depending on when it's a buyer's market and a seller's market, the answer to that question would be different, right? Um, and in this seller's market for, for talent in the, in the Rust Belt types of fields, um, you know, I think that being able to pay and provide good benefits and work-life balance is gonna be a key, <laughs> right? I mean, yes, we have to make sure that our job postings are seen, we have to have a booth at, at the baseball game. We have to be at car shows. Uh, we have to be engaging where people are interested in, in learning about us, but um, then we're gonna have to pay. Fair. Um, yeah, anything to? This is, this is the space industry. How cool <laughs> yeah, is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I feel like that you should lead with that. Like, Fair you enough. know what? Like you get to go work out and you know, like dig up a line somewhere. How would you like to develop a technology for space? Like, how would you like to solve these the same sorts of problems for space? Like, I feel like I'm sold. I don't know. That's fair. That's <laughs> yeah, fair. it you is can, fair. You can weld a wrench and you can weld a rocket. Yeah, you're, yeah exactly. You're exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, that's that's fair. Uh, and that's a great place uh, to end it. Thank you both, oh. Lee, Thank Joy. You. It was great chatting with you. Thank, Thank you. you so much.